Good morning. morning. Welcome to Grace Community Church this morning. We are glad that you are here. If you've not met me yet, my name is Teresa Breeding, and I am the Women's Ministry Director here at Grace. And I get to talk to you this morning about 2020 vision. So is there anybody in here who has 2020 vision without glasses or contacts? Two, (laughs) three, four. Four people. Y'all beat first service. First service only had three. So in our whole church, we have seven people. <laughs> they, can, <laughs> they can see 2020. Well, I can pretty much see 2020 now uh, because I had LASIK eye surgery. But when I was in my 20s, I would go to the eye doctor and I couldn't even see the E. So I knew it was an E when he would put the chart up because it's always an E. But I, I knew it was, but I could not see it at all. If I didn't know that's what it was, I couldn't tell you. Uh, so I definitely did not have 2020 vision there, but I, I do now. Um, but my hope for you today is that when we leave here today, that we will have that we will have 2020 vision, that we will be able to see 2020, the year 2020, more clearly. So let's pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for each person that's here this morning. Lord, I thank you for the experiences and the things that you brought us through in 2019, the good and the bad. Lord, you used it all to to shape us, and you're continuing to shape us and mold us into the people that that you would have us to be, Lord. And I pray that in 2020 that we will follow you and that we will uh, walk into your perfect plan. Lord, I thank you for that plan that you have for us, a plan to prosper us and not to harm us. We, We trust our future into your hands, Lord. We thank you and we praise you. May your words be heard this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I think that going into 2020, that most of us are uh, one of two things. Either we um, had a pretty good 2019, and so we're going into 2020 just kind of coasting in and trying to keep things kind of the same and hope for the best, right? We're just going to kind of go with the flow. And then there's some who didn't have a very good 2019. And so maybe you are uh, setting goals and making plans and really going to rush into 2020 uh, with hopes of making it better than 2019. I know in our staff meetings, uh, we've been talking about our vision for the new year and and, uh, things that we want to do around here at Grace and things that we want to do in our ministries um, here. And, you know, we talk about what direction we want our sermons to go, what we want our messages to be about. And next week, next Sunday, Pastor Dennis will be kicking off a new new series in the book of Genesis where we're going to be going uh, through the entire book of Genesis. And I think that if you will come and be a part of that, that your eyes will be opened, that you will learn things and hear things that you've never known or heard before uh, as we dig in to God's Word and as He's revealing it to us and we get to share it with you. Because we serve an incredible God. And he has intricately, intricately designed this world and intricately planned every day of all of our lives. And it's just amazing to watch the pieces that we get to watch unfold in the Bible. So I hope, I challenge you. I challenge you to be here and to hear these messages every Sunday. Every Sunday in 2020. That's a big challenge. Now, if you're, if you're sick or you're out of town, then watch online or watch the replays. But if you're able, I challenge you to be here every Sunday and not miss God's Word because it's going to be good. But also in our staff meetings, we talk about you know, the updates that we want to make to our building. We're hoping to update our sign uh, out front this year. We need a new sign, don't we? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Uh, So we're hoping to do that this year and make some updates to our building and to our our windows and some different things. And and we talk about our goals for our individual ministries and uh, our children's ministry. We're hoping to find a volunteer who would like to uh, lead our children's worship ministry and really develop and pour into our children. We have some, some awesome, awesome children. And if you were at the Christmas play, you heard their precious little voices And you know they need a worship ministry, and they need a worship director. We need to hear and see more of those kids. And so we're praying for that. So if you're sitting here this morning and you love Jesus, number one, you got to love Jesus, and you love children, and you love worship, then maybe that's the ministry that God's calling you to. And so I hope that you'll pray about that. 
and see where God leads you on that. And, and if so, then go see our children's director, Sarah Ferris. Or if you don't know Sarah, then you can come to me and I'll be glad to introduce you. Like I said, uh, I'm the women's ministry director here. So my hope for our women's ministry is to host our, our first ever women's ministry conference here at Grace. And so we are making plans to do that in April. And I'm really excited about that. The ladies in the group are really excited. So um, we're, we're, we're planning that. Um, but as we're talking about these things, it's kind of crazy because I remember back in 2010 when Pastor Dennis had a staff meeting and he revealed to us what he called his 2020 vision. And this was 2010, so 2020 was very far away. <laughs> and so his plan seemed really unrealistic to me. Uh, but now I see that that plan has come to pass. And what I thought was unrealistic is now a reality. He has developed a management team. He has developed a teaching team. Uh, and I, I don't think he knew where those people were coming from at the time. Uh, I think he thought he was going to hire an administrative pastor and an associate pastor. But little did he know, God was raising us up from right here inside the church. And at the time, Sam and I were in that meeting, and we were working in youth group, and we didn't think anything about, have any ideas or thoughts of ever speaking up here in big church. <laughs> you know, that's, that would have been a scary thought. And somehow God and, and Dennis just kind of maneuvered us through that. And Jeff and Jessica, they weren't even attending church at the time. Jeff was an agnostic 10 years ago, and God had a plan for him. And so it's pretty exciting to see what, what God has done. And, you know, as we've maneuvered through this plan, we've had some steps forward and some steps back, and we'll continue to have forward and back. But, but we're on the path, and we're in the plan, and we, we feel confident that this is the direction that God is leading us in. And I, if there's anything that I've ever, the, probably the most important thing I've ever learned from Dennis is that when God reveals something to you, you just go all in. You just go all in, whether it's a piece, whether it's a step, you know, because God never, rarely ever reveals his entire plan, right? We have to step into it, and he'll reveal a little more and a little more. But, but Dennis is such an incredible example of someone who, when God says it, he does it. He's, he's all in. And that's, that's who I want to be. I want to be all in. If it's, if, it's, if it's the game of chance, it's like I, I'm pushing all my chips in. I'm all in, God. I'm all in with you. And no matter what Satan throws my way, no matter how the enemy tries to interrupt it, I'm all in. I'm all in with God. Because here's the thing that we all need to be aware of. God has a plan for you in 2020. He has a plan for your whole life. And so does Satan. So does Satan. And so often we don't think about that. But I want you to think about, it's, I mean, it's odd to think about, but think about what does Satan want for you in 2020? Because if you're aware of it, because when I think about what Satan wants for me in 2020, I think he wants me to sit on my couch Binging on Doritos and pizza and Netflix. Things I would truly enjoy. <laughs> but he wants me to sit there and waste time and gain weight and lose my self-confidence and be too tired and ineffective to do anything for his kingdom, for God's kingdom. Today, in 2019, he wanted to put a big bump on my face so that I wouldn't have the confidence to stand up here and give you this message. But I'm here. I am here, Satan. <laughs> so, so it's on. <laughs> but he'll do anything to interrupt God's message. And I, and I think that we don't expect those little things. You know, I think that he wants to, to cause me to be short-tempered with my husband and my children. I think he wants to lead people into my life that will push every button I've got because I've got them. <laughs> and he knows I have a temper. He wants me to lose it and hurt my witness. It's simple things like that. Think about what does Satan want for your family? 
He wants to destroy it. He wants to destroy it. So I want you to remember that when you're fighting with your husband or you're fighting with your spouse or you're fighting with your children, they are not the enemy. There is an enemy that wants to destroy this. But it's not them. And we have to be aware of that so that we can stop him. What do you think that Satan wants for Grace Community Church in 2020? He wants it to fail. He wants it to fall apart. He wants you all to be too tired and too busy to come here. He wants to make you think that you're not worthy to walk through those doors or serve in ministry or share your testimony or invite your friends. He wants this church to fail. He wants to interrupt this ministry as well he should. He should want this church to fail. Because if every person in here fulfilled their God-given potential and got out there and pushed all their chips in for God and we were all in, we could change this community. We could could give people hope in Jesus Christ. And Satan does not want that. But what does God want for you in 2020? 2020. What does God want? God wants you to fulfill your full potential. He wants you to step into the plan that He has for you. And that looks different for all of us. But He wants you to step into His plan. And so to do that, we need to ask ourselves a few questions. So let's let's look at a story today found in John chapter 5. Now this is a true story. We spent much of 2019 studying the parables of Jesus in chronological order. Uh, And the parables were stories that Jesus told to emphasize a point. But this story today is a true story. It actually happened. So let's look at John chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. So let's look at a few of these words real quick so we can get a better idea of what this place was like. The sheep gate was the gate that they would bring the sheep through when they were taking them to the temple for sacrifice. And a pool, it wasn't like the swimming pool that you'll see in people's backyards. It was was probably structured, probably from stones, uh, but... It wasn't filled with a water hose. It was probably filled with rainwater, uh, maybe from a stream, maybe uh, spring-fed, but it was pretty natural in that aspect. Uh, The colonnades would have been uh, like covered porches or covered walkways that would shade you from the the sun and shelter you from the weather. Verse 3, it says, Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And I'm going to stop there because the next verse, verse 4, may or may not be in your Bible. Um, if, you ha- if you use the NIV Bible like I do, then it's probably not there at all. If you use King James Version, it probably is there. Um, there's some other versions that it may be there, but it may be in brackets. Uh, in my NIV, there's a notation, and so you read at the bottom why it's not there. Or if you're on the Bible app, you might have three dots up there that you can click on. Uh, to get the notation. Um, But most Bibles, you won't find verse 4. And so I, of course, wondered why that was. So I researched it, and this is what I found. Textual critics or paleographers, which were the scholars whose job, are the scholars whose job it is to compare manuscripts, have discovered that in about two dozen manuscripts, scribes, which is the people who would uh, copy the manuscript. So they, they, there weren't printing presses, so they would meticulously copy the manuscripts in that time. And that the, the scribes would put asterisk marks beside verse 4 because they were signaling to the next scribe that this was likely not something that was in the original manuscript. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Um, <coughs> I'm so sorry. Sorry. Um, But four of the last words in uh, verse 4 were not used anywhere else in John's language. And so they, in anywhere else in the book of John, so they felt like that that was probably not John's words. And 
So they, they, they put this asterisk there to kind of signal that. The King James Version was translated from um, manuscripts, and then newer manuscripts were discovered after that. And so our newer versions are translated from those newer manuscripts, and those were the ones that had the, um, or from those older manuscripts, and those were the ones that had the asterisks in them. So anyway... All that being said, that may have been too much information, but I find it very interesting, so I thought I would share that with you. Um, Either way, verse 4 is accurate. It it is accurate to the time, but it's probably just not exactly what John said, so it wasn't in his original manuscript. But if you're reading a version that has it, it would read something like this. And we'll start in verse 3. It says, In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in and was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. So the people believed that this angel would come down and stir up the water every so often, and whoever stepped into the water first would be healed of whatever was wrong with them. Now, many of the scholars believe now that there were streams uh, far away, that when a rainstorm would come far away and it would fill up these streams, that the water would rush down into this pool and it would make the water stir or it would make the water rough. Um, And I believe that is probably what happened because um, we don't have any other record in the Bible of people being healed in that water. And also, this wasn't God's normal mode of operation. He usually healed people through Jesus or through Jesus' disciples. But, you know, we don't really know. We do know that these people believed this. They believed this legend, and they would lay by the pool of Bethesda, and they would wait for the water to be stirred so that they could be the first one in. But see, when I think about this, I think, well, how does this work? You know, they lay there and they're tired and they don't know when it's coming. And then all of a sudden the water starts to stir. So the race is on and everybody runs and jumps in the water. And then how do you know who was first? You know, does everybody, they didn't get healed. So they just assume that they weren't first and somebody else must have been. Is it like the placebo effect and the guy with the headache beats the paralyzed guy, obviously, into the water? And his headache is cured, and so, you know, he was healed. Uh, I don't know. It all sounds a little bit ridiculous to me. It sounds a little too, too good to be true that you could just step into some water and be healed. But it's not unlike some of the things that we believe today. You know, it's like we watch TV and we hear, oh, you could look like this. You, know, you too could be beautiful, and you too could lose weight just you know, no diet, no exercise, just take this little pill. And we go, okay. I know, because I did it. And I did it, I lost weight for a minute, and then I gained it all back. So it wasn't as magic as I was hoping. Uh, or, you know, the guy on TV that says, you know, for 10 easy payments of 1995, you can be rich like me. Many people bought into that, maybe some of you, and you're still not rich, and that guy's richer. But we fall for these things. We believe these things. And you know why we believe these things? Because we don't actually want to do what it takes to change. I know, I'm preaching to myself, so don't be offended. (laughs) I'm preaching to myself. We we don't want to diet. We don't want to exercise. We don't want to to save money. We don't want to work hard. We, we, We want a magic pool. Verse 5. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Your your Bible may say invalid or infirmity or illness, but what we know for sure is that he had some type of of illness that he could not get around very well on his own. He He couldn't take himself into the pool. And he had been this way for 38 years. Maybe he was born with it. Maybe it developed over time. We don't know. Maybe something happened to him. We don't know. But 38 years, most likely over half his life, he was in this condition. That's a long time. And at some point, he decided to put his faith and put his hope in this pool of Bethesda. And he's been waiting. 
He's been waiting for the water to stir. We don't know how often this happened. Maybe every week, maybe every month, maybe every year. Maybe it was something like Old Faithful and they could predict it with, with you know, some type of accuracy. Either way, there's waiting. Now, I could not have, have been there waiting. I'm not a very good waiter. I don't have patience. You know, we have fast food and fast cars and high-speed internet. I change lanes at the grocery store when I think that lane's going faster than my lane. And then I, I like, I, I watch the person because I know who was behind me when I got out of line and I watch and I see if I'm going to beat them out. <laughs> I'm not a good waiter and y'all are laughing because you do the same thing. But uh, I'm not a good waiter. I certainly could not have waited 38 years. So imagine struggling with something for 38 long years. Some of you don't have to imagine. Maybe you have been struggling with something for a very long time. Some of you, you know, maybe you're not physically crippled, but maybe you've been mentally or or emotionally crippled by other things in your life that are keeping you from stepping in to God's purpose for you. Maybe, Maybe it's an addiction that you're crippled by, you know, and it's affecting your marriage and it's affecting your family. It's affecting your job. It's affecting your life. But this addiction has such a hold on you that that it's crippling you. Or maybe it's something in your marriage or in a broken relationship or something that happened in your past. And and it's crippling you. It's it's something that you you struggle with that bitterness and that, that hurt and that unforgiveness that resentment, and you hold on to it, and it's crippling you from moving forward into the plan that God has for you. You're crippled like this man. Verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, I want you to listen to this question. He asked him, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? It seems like a silly question. But you see, Jesus knew that not everyone holding up a will work for food sign will work for food. Right? You know, we have people come by here all the time asking for money. And and I know we're a church, but seriously, we're a church. You know, we don't have this big vault of money in the back to hand out. We don't have all this extra cash laying around to hand out. So we have to be very discerning about who to give it to because it's a shame that those people who really need it are mixed in with those people who are trying to take advantage of the system, who don't really need it. They want us to pay their electric bill so they can buy their beer, but not because they really need the money. So we have to be really discerning about that. And uh, Because, you know, the Bible says that if you're capable of working and you won't work, then you you don't eat. And so we've had people come by here and they say, I've tried and I've tried to find a job and I can't find a job and I can't make my car payment. I'm going to lose my car. I'm going to lose my house or my electricity is going to get shut off or whatever it may be. And Sherry says, well, you know, our gym needs to be vacuumed. If you would vacuum our gym, we'll give you that money. And in all my years of being here at Grace Community Church, it's almost 18 years, one person did it. One person that's sad. So not everyone that says they want help actually needs help. And or actually, actually wants help. Truly. Jesus is saying, are you willing to work for food? Do you want to change? Do you want to get well? Because truly, if people were honest, there's some people that don't want to get well. They say they do, but they really don't. They don't, want to get, they don't want their marriage to get better because then they wouldn't have anything to complain about. They don't want their health to get better because then nobody would feel sorry for them. You know, if, if they got better, then they'd have to live better. We all know people like this. So the real question is, do you want to get well? Do you want your life to change? 
It's a yes or no question. And listen to how he replies in verse 7. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. It's a yes or no question. His answer, I can't. I can't. Nobody will help me into the water and I can't. Listen, if you have cancer and Jesus Christ himself is standing in front of you, are you going to ask him for healing? Or are you going to ask him to take you to your chemotherapy treatment? This guy had the healer standing in front of him. And he's still focused on the pool. I can't get in the pool. Can you help me in the pool? And now don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that if, if you have cancer that you shouldn't get chemotherapy, that you should just trust in Jesus. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you have both. You know, the Lord has used our, our medical doctors and our medical treatments to heal people. He uses that all the time. But what I'm saying is that if you have chemotherapy and you don't have Jesus, your healing is temporary. Jesus is eternal. This guy, he didn't need magic water. He needed Jesus. But his faith had been misplaced. I think maybe he had just resigned himself to his fate. He had surrounded himself with other people who had resigned themselves to their fate. You know, maybe this is you today. Are, are you working in a dead-end job that you absolutely hate going to every day? But it's easier to go there than it is to, to make a change? You, you, you've just become content because you don't want to step out into the unknown? Maybe 2020 is the year that you go to some night classes and you prepare yourself for something better, or something that you actually like and look forward to and enjoy. Pray about it. Because, you know, when you seriously set aside time to talk to God, and I'm not saying to just give Him your list of what you want. He's not Santa Claus. When you actually pray and have a conversation with Him, and listen for His answers. He will put thoughts in your mind that you would have never had before. Thoughts that you know are not your own. And then I know we question ourselves and say, well, was that from God or was that just me? If it lines up with God's Word, if it does not contradict God's Word, then why wouldn't it be from God? Yeah, I mean, if you're praying and you feel like God's telling you to rob a bank... Probably not God, but <laughs> it doesn't line up with his word. You got to know his word. That's important. You got to be in his word. But the Holy Spirit speaks to us too and gives us those little urgings that tell us right from wrong. That's our conscience. It's our Holy Spirit speaking to us. So have a conversation with God. It tells us later in verse 13 that the sick man did not even recognize Jesus. He's right there with him and he didn't even recognize him. And that's the same for us too. He's right here with us every day. He is very active in our lives. He's not active in other people's lives. He's active in your life. And you don't even realize it because we're so fixed on our own pools of Bethesda that we don't recognize our healer. You know, what is it that you're praying about? When you pray, do you tell God or do you ask God? You know, is your prayer, dear God, do this? Or is your prayer, God, what do I need to do in this situation? Lead me, guide me, direct me. He wants to move us forward in the plans that he has for us. You know, maybe you're in a dating relationship and you're praying, please God, change him. Please God, fix this. Please God, make this better. I know if we got married, everything would be better. And God's saying, well, I got this perfect guy for you right over here, but you're so focused on this pool of Bethesda.
We're focusing on our own ways. This man is so confused and so focused on his own way that when Jesus asks him if he wants to be healed, instead of saying yes, he says, I can't. So the next question is, why can't you? Why can't you get better? Well, I can't because my husband's not a Christian and he don't go to church and he don't want me to go to church and he don't want me to live for God and so I just can't. Or I can't do this or I can't do that because I don't, I don't have enough education. Or I'm too fat or I'm too skinny or I'm too short, I'm too tall, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too broke. I can't. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, but God can. God can. Luke 18, 27 says, What is impossible with man is possible with God. Verse 8, Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat, and walked. I can't. You can't. But God can. And if God can, then you have no excuse. You can do all things through Him who gives you strength. So this is my resolution for 2020. And I challenge you to make the same one because it's the only one you need. Stop making excuses. Resolve to stop making excuses. That's it. You want to lose weight? Stop making excuses. You want to spend time with your family? Stop making excuses. You want to save money? Get out of debt? Stop making excuses. You want to get closer to God and attend church more? Stop making excuses. You want to conquer that addiction? Stop making excuses. Make a decision to pick up your mat or like my daddy would say pick yourself up by your bootstraps stop feeling sorry for yourself stop wallowing in the past and step in to the plan that God has for you 2019 may not have went the way you wanted it to go it may have been rough But if you are sitting here this morning or if you're watching online this morning, then you still have breath in your lungs. You still have hope and there is still opportunity for good days ahead. You just have to surrender to Him, to His will. Because let's let's be real honest for a minute. Raise your hand if there's something that you need to change. Me too. I need need to raise both hands. I do, because I need to tell myself no sometimes. Keep your hands raised. We all have something that we need to change, don't we? Let's surrender that to God. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for every hand that's raised here this morning. You know, you know the changes that need to be made. Big or small, you know why we're raising our hands this morning, Lord. We surrender it to you to you, Lord, the healer. You are our healer. We surrender our pools of Bethesda. The enemy will cripple us no more. Lord, you are our healer and we put our trust and our faith in you. We thank you for the coming year. We thank you for the plan that you have for us. Lord, help us to walk in that. Lord, reveal those steps to us and let us walk in your victory. Jesus' name.